problem. So here we go. Yes. So what um, what I'm going to do for about the next 30 minutes is tell you about the work that we've been doing for the last 20, 30 years, looking at the relationship between sleep, fatigue, and biological rhythms in patients with cancer. Most of the work that I've done, the earlier work, was in breast cancer, but some of our later work was in, in all different types of cancer. I started out, just to give you a little background, I started out researching sleep, studying sleep. Sleep is really my main area, uh, and it was actually sleep and aging. But as part of that, um, through some other colleagues, I became very interested in what happens to sleep in chronic illness with cancer being the model um, for, for this line of research. Uh, so I'll go through some of the data. I promise I'll leave lots of time for questions uh, and I look forward to having a discussion at the end with all of you. So let's see. What I'm gonna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about the relationship between sleep and fatigue. We're gonna talk about light treatment we're gonna talk about circadian rhythms and then what happens to all these things over time. So the first thing we, I wanna do is define cancer-related fatigue for you. If you have cancer or you've had cancer, you know what this is and you know that it's different from the everyday kind of fatigue. Cancer-related fatigue is one of the most frequent complaints of patients with cancer with over three quarters of, of patients, particularly those undergoing chemotherapy or radiation therapy, reporting that they feel very weak and tired. And not only is it the symptom often that they have the most concern about, it often is so bad that people stop their cancer treatment, which of course has all sorts of negative um, consequences. And so we felt it was really important to understand fatigue and see if we can find a way to get it under control. Cancer-related fatigue is defined as a distressing, persistent, subjective sense of tiredness or exhaustion that is related to either the cancer or the cancer treatment. And it's not proportional to recent activity, but does interfere with everyday functioning. And it's different from the sort of everyday kind of fatigue in that everyday kind of fatigue is temporary. And if you rest, it gets better. Cancer-related fatigue does not improve with rest. It's more severe and it's much more distressing than your everyday kind of fatigue. There are obviously lots of different things that contribute to cancer-related fatigue. Can you see my pointer? Will, can you, is my pointer visible? Uh, yes, well, it's very small, but uh, we see it. Yeah, it's small, but all right. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll do our best. So cancer-related fatigue has a lot of things that contribute to it. There's uh, physiological factors, such as pain. There's psychological factors. There's socioeconomic factors. But for me, being a sleep researcher, the factors that I was most interested in were the chronobiological factors, sleep, and our circadian rhythms and how those may relate to the cancer-related fatigue. The one question that needed to be asked is, the poor sleep that we see in cancer, is it secondary to cancer or not? One of my colleagues uh, in, in uh, Canada and Quebec, Jose Savard, did a study. This was multi, um, all different kinds of cancers. And she asked patients, when did your insomnia, when did your difficulty sleeping begin? And you can see that two thirds of them had difficulty sleeping even before the cancer diagnosis. Now, in all fairness, we don't know when the cancer itself actually begins, right? When do those cells start mutating? We don't know. We only know from the point of diagnosis. But nevertheless, two thirds had difficulty sleeping before their diagnosis. Having said that, more than half felt that once they had their diagnosis, once they were getting treatment, their sleep got worse. So there definitely is a relationship between poor sleep and what happens to us uh, when we have cancer. Um, so we began studying this. We use something called an actigraph. Uh, these days, they look just like a little watch. I don't know if you can see on her wrist down here. In the olden days, they were much bigger. I, I used to say they were the size 
of half a blackboard eraser, but these days nobody knows what a blackboard is either. So uh, maybe it's like a small cigarette pack size and it's worn on the wrist and it measures wrist movement. And from that wrist movement, we can estimate when someone is asleep and when someone is awake. Basically, when we're awake, we're moving, when we're asleep, we're not. So this plot, and I hope you can see my arrow, I have to find it. This plot here is an actigraph plot. We recorded uh, what we call pre-chemotherapy. So this is three consecutive 24 hours, so 72 hours before they started their chemotherapy. This is 72 hours of week one, cycle one of chemotherapy. Remember, these are all breast cancer patients. This is 72 hours of cycle one, week two, and then week three. We gave them a break for two cycles, and then this is week one, two, and three of cycle four. And what you're looking at here is when you see a lot of these dark lines, that's a lot of movement, that means the person's awake. And when you see very few lines, a lot of the quiet time, that's when they're asleep. And you can almost eyeball this and see that as the chemotherapy progresses, the sleep period gets worse and worse. And if we added up all these numbers, you'd find that on average, these patients are sleeping about 70% of the night, which is clearly not enough. You wanna be, that comes out to about five, six hours, not enough. We need seven to eight hours of sleep. So we looked a little more closely at what happens to the different symptoms as the women were going through their chemotherapy. We, we broke them into three groups based on what they reported about their sleep, what they reported about their fatigue, and what they reported about their mood. You know what, I think, hold on one second. I think I can get a better pointer here. There we go. Better now? I think you can see yep. that better. Yep, that's better. Okay. So we, we broke them into three groups based on these three symptoms. And what we found is that all three of these symptoms got worse during chemotherapy. But those that had the most symptoms to start out with did the worst. So let me show you the data. That's sort of the punchline. And here are the data. So this is a questionnaire that asks about your sleep quality. A higher score means worse sleep. Our three groups were the pink are the women that had none of those three symptoms pre-chemotherapy. The yellow are those women that had one or two of those three. And the um, blue are those women that had all three of those symptoms before they started the chemo. So here are the three groups. And what you see is during cycle one and cycle four, everything gets worse. But the more symptoms they start out with, for example, this blue group, the worse they do, especially in week one. As some of you may know, week one of each cycle is when the chemotherapy is given. So that's always the hardest week. And then week two and three were sort of recovery weeks. So in week one in each, in each cycle, the symptoms are the worst. And the more they start out with, the worse they do. Here's similar data on the fatigue scale. Again, a higher score is worse. Here are our three groups. And you can see during week one of both cycles, um, everything gets worse, but especially for those women that start out with more symptoms. So what this tells us is that if we could target some of these symptoms, even before people begin their chemotherapy, they might have an easier time with the symptoms during chemotherapy. Unfortunately, that study has yet to be done. I wrote several grants trying to get that funded to do that study, and then I had to retire for many reasons. And so that study, we're still trying to get that study going and somebody to fund that. Now, part of this whole sleep um, world is circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are our biological rhythms. Circadian means about 24 hours. So these are rhythms that cycle throughout the day and night. For example, um, core body temperature has a circadian 24 hour rhythm. Blood pressure has a 24 hour rhythm. Blood pressure dips at night, comes back in the morning. Many of our hormones have 24 hour rhythms. And of course, sleep wake is a 24 hour rhythm. And so we wanted to examine 
what happens to our circadian rhythms before and after chemotherapy. And what we found was, here we're looking at how strong or how rhythmic is this, the, are, are these patients' rhythms. And what we find here, it is pre-chemo, down is worse. And you can see in cycle one, week one, there's a significant reduction in the strength of that rhythm. But during weeks two and three, they're able to recover back to the pre-chemotherapy levels. By the time you get to cycle four, again, week one, when they're getting their chemotherapy, it's tremendously reduced. And in weeks two and three, you can see they're trying to recover, but they can't quite make it back up to the pre-chemotherapy levels. And what that tells us is that the first administration of chemotherapy is associated with a transient disruption in the circadian rhythms. But repeated administrations of chemotherapy results in progressively worse and more enduring impairments in our circadian rhythms. So you should be asking now, so what? Why do we care if our circadian rhythms are disrupted? Well, we know from many other studies and other populations that disrupted rhythms increase the risk of mortality. We know that from data in uh, patients with dementia, we know that in a subgroup of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. We know that in general, in older men and women, you get increased risk of cardiovascular events, cardiovascular disease-related mortality, and higher all-cause mortality. So having disrupted rhythms does have negative consequences. So we know how to uh, fix circadian rhythms. We fix it with bright light. Bright light is the strongest cue for our bodies to know when to wake up, when to go to sleep. And it's the strongest cue for strengthening our circadian rhythms. We also know that bright light has an alerting effect. And it's been used to treat depression and different types of depression. It's been used to treat circadian rhythm disorders, like for example, jet lag or shift work. And we know that fatigue has also been associated with many of these other disorders, like circadian rhythm disorders and depression. But we knew very little about the association between bright light and fatigue. And so we decided to do a study where we gave bright light to women with breast cancer to see if we could both improve their rhythms and improve their fatigue. But before we could give them bright light, we had to examine how much light are they getting in general. So this is a, a, a measure of how much light. The yellow here is the first week of, um, well, this yellow is, is uh, pre-chemo. So this was our baseline. This is week one of cycle one and then week one of cycle four. And lux is a measure of light. To give you an example, if it was a clear sunny day at noon and you were to go out and look at the horizon, that would be about 100,000 lux. That would be very bright. If you're sitting in your house with your regular lights in your room, that's maybe somewhere between two and 500 lux. It's not very bright. And what we see here is, in fact, is pre-chemotherapy, the women were getting just under 500 lux. During chemotherapy, it went down to 300. They're essentially sitting in the dark. And if you look at how many minutes of bright light they did get, before chemo, it was about an hour. During chemo, it was only about half an hour. And we could tell that the more fatigue they had, the less light exposure they had. And this then gave us the encouragement to increase light exposure to see if that would in fact improve fatigue and rhythms. So my theory was, I lost my pointer, there we go, was that the side effects of the chemotherapy were making the patients very tired and uh, resulting with disrupted circadian rhythms. The more fatigued they were, the less time they went outdoors. You know, when you're so fatigued, you just can't move. The last thing you think about is going for a walk outside. The less time they spent outdoors, the less bright light they got. The less bright light they got, the worse their fatigue and the more disrupted the rhythms. And this set up this negative feedback loop. 
So they, it just would get worse and worse and worse. And my question was, I always have a problem with this next slide coming up. Huh? Here we go. My question was, if we increase, artificially increase bright light, could we break that loop and therefore improve the fatigue and the rhythms? And that's what we did. We studied 40 women, all with stage one to three breast cancer. They were randomized to receive either bright white light or dim red light. So we were testing different uh, light frequencies. And they were instructed to sit in front of the light box every morning for half an hour. And here you see one of our patients. She's wearing her actograph so we can record her sleep wake. And she's sitting in front of this special light box um, to get her increased bright light exposure. And what we found was this. So here's what we're looking at. The yellow are the women that were got the bright white light. The pink are the people got that got the dim red light. And we're looking at a change score here from pre-chemotherapy levels. So again, we have cycle one, week one, cycle one, the last week, cycle four, week one, and cycle four, last week. And what you see, if you look first at the women who got the bright, well, let's look at the, the dim red light first. The women that got dim red light had increased fatigue during one um, of cycle one. It got a little better during the last week. It got really bad during week one of cycle four and then got a little better again in the last week, which is the typical pattern. It's what we saw previously that fatigue gets worse during chemotherapy, particularly during the first week of each cycle. On the other hand, the group that got the white light did not get worse. There's no significant difference between any of these four time points, although it looks like they're getting better and worse. This is actually no significant change. What this means is that their fatigue did not get worse. It didn't go away. I was hoping we would, it would be a cure for fatigue. It was not, but it kept it at pre-chemotherapy levels, which, you know, I was willing to accept that. If we could keep these women's fatigue from getting worse, that was already a huge step forward. And that's what we found. What about the effect on their circadian rhythms? Because remember, we talked how important that was. So here are the pre-chemotherapy levels. Again, dim red light. This time, the bright white light is blue. Um, and you can see, again, we look at the, at the dim red light first, it got worse during chemotherapy. And in fact, in, in this sample, it continued to stay below pre-chemo levels, and it got even worse during cycle four and stayed worse. The um, group that got the bright white light still got worse in the first week in both cycle one and cycle four, but they were able to return to baseline levels in both cycles. So remember, before treatment by cycle four, it looked more like this dim red light group. They couldn't recover. The rhythms continued to be disrupted. With a bright white light, they were able to recover to, to having more normal, more robust rhythms. So we were very excited about that. Now you might ask, what does that mean to have a good rhythm or a disrupted rhythm? So let me show you. These are the circadian, this is one patient who got the dim red light. This is pre-chemotherapy, and what you see here is a lot of activity during the day, very little activity at night. Each black dot there represents activity. So you can actually draw a rhythm here. So pre-chemo, they had a rhythm that wasn't too bad. There was good distinction between activity in the day and activity at night. Here's the first week of cycle one, and you can eyeball this, and you can see a lot more activity during the night, a lot less activity during the day. And you see the height of this rhythm is quite reduced because the robustness of the rhythm is reduced. This is the, the last week or the recovery week of cycle one. Not as bad as this first week, but not as good as pre. And here's cycle four. You can see much worse than cycle one. And this just continues. So sort of keep these pictures in your head. This was the dim red light group. This is the bright white light group. Again, pre-chemo week one, you can see it's not that much worse than it was pre-chemo. And as we go throughout our chemotherapy, it stays, the rhythm stays more robust. Stronger rhythms mean there will be better health overall.
So that's what we're talking about when we talk about disrupted rhythms. Now, when I retired eight years ago, um, there's some of my colleagues around the world who were so intrigued by this research that they continue doing it, and I've been collaborating with them. So this is another light treatment study. As you can see, this was mixed cancer, and this is survivors now. So my study was during chemotherapy, and this is survivors. Um, again, uh, baseline, so before they began their treatment, the red is the dim red light, the yellow is the bright uh, white light. In this particular fatigue scale, a higher score means better or less fatigue. Um, this is after two weeks of treatment, after four weeks of treatment, treatment ended, and then we kept following them for another three weeks. And you can see the bright white light group, in this case, actually the fatigue improved. So remember, in my study, it didn't improve. We just kept it from getting worse. But in survivors, the fatigue actually significantly improved. So to summarize the light treatment part of this, what the results of our bright light study show is that the bright white light prevented deterioration during chemotherapy and resulted in improvements in survivors in fatigue, in sleep, in mood, I didn't show you all these data, but these were our results, in mood, in quality of life, and in circadian rhythm disruption. All very important results to improve life and improve symptoms in cancer patients and cancer survivors. Now, um, the other thing we were very interested in is what happens to these symptoms over time? This was actually part of a study looking at cognition. You know, you've heard of, of chemo brain, Many patients with cancer develop a fogginess. I wouldn't call it necessarily a cognitive impairment, but a fogginess that can last for a year or more even after the end of treatment. It was identified first in breast cancer, but it's now been identified in all different kinds of cancers. And as part of studying that, we were looking at all these symptoms over time. So this time what we're looking at is the blue is pre-chemotherapy, the pink is after four cycles of chemotherapy, and the yellow is a year later. And we had here breast cancer patients, and then we had non-cancer patients. We actually asked our cancer patients to nominate a friend who might want to participate, and that's how we, we uh, got our non-cancer patients, or what's called controls here. And there's several, so here we're looking at nap time, here we're looking at the fatigue, here we're looking at sleep quality, and here we're looking at depression. And it doesn't matter which graph you look at, the results are the same. And what the results tell us are, first of all, even pre-chemotherapy, the patients had worse everything than the controls. So even before they began the chemotherapy, they had more fatigue, they were napping more, they had worse sleep, and they had more depressive symptoms than the non-cancer patients. During chemotherapy, everything got worse compared to their pre-chemotherapy levels. A year later, they came back down to their pre-chemotherapy levels, but they were still worse than the controls. So no matter when you tested them, they were always worse than the controls, worse during chemo, and they were able to recover. So um, what this tells us is of many things. I'm going to sort of summarize everything now and then we'll go to questions. There's a lot more data. Just in half an hour, I can't show you everything. But depending on your questions, I can tell you more. So first of all, what we learned is that women with breast cancer, and I think this is probably true of most cancers, experience fatigue and poor sleep even before they begin their chemotherapy. And we know that both this, all this poor sleep and being tired is different than fatigue. They're not the same. They are related. And the worse your sleep is at night, night, the worse the fatigue will be during the day. And that's true both before and during chemotherapy. All these symptoms get worse during chemotherapy, but the more symptoms you start out with pre-chemo, the worse you do during chemo. And at one year, all the symptoms returned to the pre-chemo level, but were still worse than they would be in non-cancer um, comparison groups. Circadian rhythms become disynchronized during chemotherapy with repeated administration of chemo resulting progressively worse and more enduring rhythm impairments. During chemotherapy, women get very little bright light exposure, but giving them increased light 
helped prevent deterioration of fatigue or improved it, improved rhythms, improved sleep and quality of life, both in the patients and in survivors. And then I have all sorts of wonderful uh, collaborators, of course, and this work was funded by the National Cancer Institutes of NIH, as well as the California Breast Cancer Research Program. And I'm grateful to all of them for the funding we had. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And um, I'm open to questions. I, I have a question. Um, you know, based on this research, have are there any particular uh, products that are like light focused uh, products that help you know with depression and uh, that you recommend or that like you you've heard work particularly well that that yeah. maybe some of us so, can. So yeah, that's a great question. So first, let me say that our best source of bright light is the sun, right? The best thing you can do, especially when the weather is still nice. I live in San Diego, so I'm a little biased. We get nice weather pretty much year round. Not all of you do. Um, but if you can get outside in the morning, whether you're going for a walk or just sitting in your backyard or on your terrace or whatever opportunity you have to get outside in the morning, that's your best source of light. The key, however, is to do it without sunglasses. And the reason for that is that the mechanism of the light affecting all these things, because it all comes through our brain, the, the, the mechanism is through the eyes. It comes through the retinal hypothalamic tract from the eyes right to the brain, to the place where our clock lives in our brain. So going outside in the morning with no sunglasses is your best source of light. If you can't do that because you don't have a place to go or it's too cold or it's too dark, then there are light boxes. Are there also now light goggles that you can buy? I would say the goggles are probably a little easier because then you don't have to sit in front of the box. You can wear them and walk around your house. I wouldn't drive with them, but you can certainly walk around your house or your office or wherever you happen to be. There are different ones out there. You can actually just Google it and see. I'm a little hesitant to recommend any one over another. I don't want to push one product over another, but um, there are quite a few out there. Some of them are white light. Some of them are green light or blue light. Different frequencies have different, uh, sometimes have better effects than others, um, but that's what I would look for. What duration of white light uh, have you used in your studies? How much is enough? And how much uh, gets to a point of the diminishing returns? Right, so we did half an hour. Um, in the olden days, I've been doing this research a long time, in the olden days, the boxes were much bigger. They were like two feet by, you know, two feet, they'd be this huge box, and they wouldn't be as bright. In those days, we'd have to sit in front of them for two hours, but the newer ones are much brighter. Half an hour is sufficient. Um, and the key is to do it as early in the morning after you first wake up. Hope that answered your question. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I'm going to ask for a show of hands, but I, I can't see any of you. All I see are your names. Um, I'm wondering how many of you, um, I, I don't know how many of you are survivors, how many of you have cancer, how many of you just have an interest in this topic. Um, but I'm wondering if you are a survivor or if you currently have cancer, if you're experiencing fatigue. Um, I guess we won't do a show of hands, but if you are, I would encourage you to try to increase your morning light exposure. Um, there have been quite a few studies now, more than what I've shown you, that show it can be quite, quite effective. We also, I don't know if any of you have any questions about the chemo brain, the fogginess. We can talk a little bit about that. Chava, did you have a question about that? Go ahead. 
I didn't, hi, I didn't um, have to do chemo. I, um, I did three weeks of radiation treatment mm -hmm. um, in late June into July. Um, but so I, it's now October and um, I, I'm more tired now than I was um, previously. So okay. my question, you said to, you know, obviously the best is sunlight and, but being blue eyed, I have, you know, it's, the sunlight is very sensitive. So, but, um, but with having to wear masks now, glasses are a problem. So is right. it okay to be wearing just, you know, like a baseball hat or just to, is that? Absolutely. That, In fact, if you're gonna go outside, I should have said this, I usually do. Wear a hat, wear sunscreen, definitely protect yourself. Oh no, I'm, I'm asking in the sense, sorry, I'm asking in the sense because to, to do the morning walk or in the, you know, when there's the bright light to get, to get what yeah. you're saying, but to not wear sunglasses. So, Correct. but right. it's all right I'm, to get that treatment with wearing the hat. So yes, that's what I'm saying. No, no, I'm agreeing with you. Absolutely. When you go outside in the morning to get your bright light, definitely wear a hat just no sunglasses. I don't care how big the brim is on your hat. Okay. The key is just don't cover your eyes because the darkness of the sunglasses is what blocks all that good light. Mm -hmm. The hat won't block it because the light's everywhere. You're uh -huh. not looking at the sun, you know, that's not what I want you to do. Right. Just regular being outside, the ambient light is much brighter than what you can get with normal room lights inside. The other thing you one can try we don't actually have data to show if this works, but, but if you have no other choice and you can't go outside, but it is sunny out, is sit next to your window, open the blinds, and just look out the window. Again, you're not looking at the sun, but just look out the window because that sh still should be brighter than what you get inside the house. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, lately I've been with, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm had stage one uh, breast cancer. So uh, in taking the medications, I'm finding recently now I'm, I'm averaging four, maybe five hours of sleep when I'm usually, you know, eight, nine hours of sleep on a regular. So, but mm -hmm. being like literally whatever time I fall asleep at night, I like clockwork, it's just four hours and then I'm up for a couple of hours. So I'm not getting you're okay. not getting full night's sleep. All right. Couple things. First is try getting that bright light in the morning because that might also help your sleep. Number one. Number two, there are um, behavioral treatments that we use for people that are waking up and can't get back to sleep. Um, I don't think I have time now to talk to you about what you may be doing, but let me just give you a few. Um, uh, ideas of what you might try. The, and this applies to anyone that's having trouble sleeping. The first is don't look at your clock. If you have a clock, our, our tendency when we first wake up at night is to see what time it is. That's the worst thing you can do for your sleep for many reasons. So get rid of the clock. You don't need a clock in your bedroom. You don't need your phone in your bedroom. If you're afraid you're going to miss an important call or you need to use an alarm to wake up, put it under the bed, put it somewhere where you're not tempted to look at it when you wake up in the middle of the night. That's number one. Number two, when you get up, try to just keep your eyes closed. Don't even open them. That's the problem with the clock is you open your eyes and you wake yourself up even more. See if you can just keep your eyes closed and stay relaxed and see if you can fall back to sleep. If you don't, at the point that you find yourself getting tense and anxious and upset that you haven't fallen back to sleep, get out of bed and leave the bedroom. And do something that's quiet and relaxing in another room, hopefully without too much light. The darker your environment, the better you sleep. It has to do with our melatonin production, mm -hmm. not the melatonin you buy over the counter, but we produce melatonin in our brain. And that helps us sleep. Light tells your brain to stop secreting melatonin and it's time to wake up. So you want, first of all, your bedroom to be as dark as possible. But when you leave your bedroom, you don't want too much light there either. So you can read if you want, you can watch TV. If you're reading on a device, try to reverse it. So it's a white print on a black background that has less light into your eyes than, than the other way around. 
But if you're going to read or watch TV, make sure it's something you can put down as soon as you get sleepy. You don't want to get sucked into a show or a book where you're tired, you're ready to go back to sleep, but you want to see the end. And so you force yourself to stay up. That's a no-no. So I say, you know, read a magazine where it's short and easy to put down. Watch an infomercial that's easy to turn off. Because the second you start getting sleepy, you want to go back to bed. Mm. And when you go back to bed, if lo and behold, even though your eyes were closing, once you get into bed, you don't fall asleep and you start getting tense and upset again, back out of bed again. The whole idea is to retrain your brain to look at the bed and think, ah, I'm going to sleep. Not, oh my God, I'm going to toss and turn and I'm going to be so tired and get upset about it. So the main rules are you only go to bed if you're sleepy. If it's 11 o'clock at night and you're not sleepy, you don't go to bed. You go to bed only when you're sleepy. You only stay in bed if you're asleep. So you don't stay in bed if you're awake, tossing and turning and getting upset about it. You get up at the same time every day. So even though you may have been getting in and out of bed multiple times, if your set time to normally get out of bed is seven, you get out of bed at seven every morning. This is one case where you may want to set an alarm in case you're sleeping in. Again, put it under the bed. Um, and if you do these things, that will help you improve your sleep. It's called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. You can go online and look it up. Um, there are online um, uh, uh, programs to help you deal and go through the CBTI, cognitive behavioral therapy. But those are essentially the main rules. So good luck. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very, very much. That's really helpful information. Great. Any other questions? We don't have a big group today. It's a small group. We have lots of opportunity to get good discussion going. I was so clear that no one has any questions. Hmm. <laughs> Let me say a couple words about the fogginess, the chemo brain, because I know a lot of people experience it. Some people may not want to talk about it, but this fogginess is real. Don't let anyone tell you that it's not. It can last for several years after the end of chemotherapy. And we have data to suggest that the disrupted circadian rhythms might be the best predictor of whether someone will become foggy or not. So again, that morning bright light may also help with some of that fogginess that comes along with the cancer treatments. Light is a wonderful thing. Light is very powerful. We should all be cancer, no cancer, fatigue, no fatigue. Morning bright light is very good for our rhythms and our sleep-wake in general. <laughs>